Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to yet another class of Control Systems 2. As usual, we'll start with some notes. Um, good news first, I've been told that uh, the official course evaluation started, so please fill it up. Um, the last class of this course is going to be a recap class. We are going to address uh, the most uh, common outstanding questions. We created a, a, a thread on Piazza for you to just uh, put your doubts in any form. We will then just compile all the possible doubts and see what are the uh, questions we will address. If we don't get enough questions, uh, we'll come up with something. So less good news, uh, um, lab rules, lab rules. They're important. Rules exist because uh, they have a purpose. No eating and drinking in the labs. No leaving windows open. No leaving lights on. Absolutely no leaving doors open. I came here yesterday night. Excuse me. I came here yesterday night. The lab door was completely open and there is a ducky town still lying in the middle of the corridor. University is a public place. We cannot just leave a federally funded equipment for thousands of bucks open in the middle of the road. Doors have to be closed. You can bring ducky towns in the middle of the corridor. We understand that the lab is small. It cannot accommodate all of you. It's okay to work in the corridor as long as you're there when you work and you clean up when you're done. That is not our space. We cannot just occupy it for days with stuff in the middle of the road. If I find the lab open again, I will regulate access to it. I'll close it up and uh, you won't have uh, the possibility to work on your hardware exercises anymore and we'll just make uh, um, supervised hours with TAs, uh, whatever, six, eight hours a week. So please, please, please make sure that you close the doors and treat the hardware with uh, due respect. Hook up the ducky bots when you're done. If there are hardware failures, tell the TAs. We're going to switch them. We're going to do something. Um, but please do not just leave the lab door open because it's really um, a wrong thing to do. Secondly, while I might be personally glad that uh, the ducky town spontaneously grows out of the door, I mean, I enjoy that, I'm afraid that our neighbors don't really share this enthusiasm, so do not put uh, ducky towns in front of the door because there is an access to a workshop nearby where they come back and forth with equipment, and uh, we need to leave passageways uh, free all the time, okay? So you can go in the corridor, but you need to clean up. This is a picture from yesterday night. You can see the lab door is open and there's a stuff in the middle of the road and that's really bad. I think it's still there. Anyways, so big picture, what's going on? We have uh, started talking about controls. We realized that uh, MIMO systems are uh, tough to control because of their multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Uh, the interactions between the different channels cause issues because uh, um, we cannot just apply the CISO control methods that we are used to. Of course, there are some exceptions. Um, it is possible to evaluate the degree of MIMO-ness of a system by checking what is the level, the degree of interaction between the input and the output channels. We have done this uh, through the relative gain array, and we've seen that when uh, this relative gain array is, uh, is uh, diagonally dominant, it indicates that there is a possible pairing between inputs and outputs that allow us to uh, consider the MIMO system as if it were a basically union of CISO systems, in which case it is very much possible just to independently control each channel in your favorite CISO way. Um, when this is not the case, then uh, we can always uh, uh, have an approach, uh, at an attempt at uh, decoupling control, that is, putting some, some transformations, some pre-compensators, some post-compensators that allow us to recast the problem from the MIMO to a, 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 a diagonally dominant system, which again would allow us then to do the centralized control. We have seen, though, that this uh, mechanism typically works when uh, uh, you use a, a, an inverse-based approach, uh, that is, inverting the plant. And inverting the plant has its own uh, headaches because uh, um, a number of things can go wrong from having an uncertain model that, uh, that forbids exact cancellation, which is the whole point of uh, plant inversion as well as uh, um, if the plant is not proper, then you have uh, an unrealizable inverse and the things like this. So when these situations don't, don't happen, so when we can't recast a MIMO system, a MIMO control problem into a, a decentralized control one, 
we'll have to go with something a little bit more sophisticated, a, a, a fully centralized, let's say, a fully MIMO control approach. And um, we have uh, um, looked at internal model control as a way of doing this, and we've seen there that uh, um, it is possible to gain some extra, let's say, features in controlling a system when you feed back not just the uh, system measured output, but when you go and, uh, uh, and compare what is your understanding of the, of the system, that is your uh, prediction based on a nominal model of the system, and the actual uh, measurement. So the difference between these two signals is uh, something we referred to as an uncertainty signal, as a, as a today we'll call it an innovation signal, and uh, it's a, something that is very uh, useful to, to uh, move forward because it tells us, look, it's maybe something more can be done than just uh, measuring the output and feeding back that, as we were used to do. Uh, so uh, moved by this intuition, we, we, we started asking ourselves, well, is there something else we could uh, feed back to understand, to, to control our system? And we saw that uh, states are a good candidate for this. And uh, we went through uh, state feedback. We saw that uh, it's actually a really uh, powerful tool. State feedback is really great. It's really great, why? Because it allows us to uh, arbitrarily pay, place the poles of the uh, closed loop uh, 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 system. And this means if you place the poles however you want, well, that means you can have arbitrary performances. So you can just uh, cancel the native poles of the system and replace them with the ones in the left-hand uh, plane uh, in any position that you want, gaining uh, the, the system characteristics, the closed-loop system characteristics that are desired. Um, and, uh, but, but, but state feedback had a little issue. Um, apart that, of course, it required the system to be reachable, and reachability is this concept of the input actually having uh, the, the capability to affect the different states, because this is not given for granted. Uh, it really depends on the structure of the system. We saw it depends on the A and B matrices. This means always think about the A matrix as something given to you by nature. Okay, there's nothing really you can do about that. A comes from the laws of physics, on the approximations you made, on the model you make of the system. The B matrix is, is, is related to the input, right? So I'm thinking about X dot equals AX plus BU. The B matrix is related to the input. In a real problem, the input is, uh, I mean, it's most of the time, that's something that's up to the practitioner to decide where you're going to put your actuators to actually affect the system. So there is a degree of, uh, of uh, liberty in checking where the, how the B matrix uh, uh, is structured. So we saw that if the system is reachable, then we can do this, uh, feedback this state feedback control, and we can arbitrarily place the poles, and that is great. Uh, but we have to get in the nitty-gritty details. We have to um, go and verify what are the previous poles. We want to decide where do we want to put our poles, and that might induce a number of considerations that, of course, th they can be positive, but at the same time, it takes away from the bigger picture. Let's say it's difficult to uh, relate directly, for example, the input cost to the, to the, to the um, placement of the poles. So we stepped it a little bit, we stepped our game up a little bit, and we said, okay, now let's, 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 let's go with a more um, mathematically intensive way. Last class was a little bit mathematically intensive, not all of you appreciated it, uh, but it was necessary to understand how these things go, how they work in detail, because uh, that's the whole point of the linear quadratic regulator, for example, that we studied last time. It's, it's, it's uh, the first of a family of methods that allows us to um, focus only on the big picture. That is, uh, we define a cost function. We say, let's just write down this performance metric, okay? For example, we wrote down the performance metric by being a weighted sum of something that we referred to as the energy of the input and another term that was the, uh, let's say, the tracking error. Consider that every time we say we're solving a regulator problem, a regulator problem means you have zero reference. So when you see just the, uh, the norm of the output being minimized, or the actually of the controlled variables uh, being minimized, well, that you can imagine it as z minus zero, that is the difference between the actual output and what you would like to uh, achieve as a set point. Um, so we solved the linear quadratic regulator problem, and we saw that uh, uh, this, this, this is a fun thing to notice. Maybe I didn't stress it enough last time. We did not impose the uh, feedback structure. We didn't say, you has to be kx, a state feedback, and then let's see what k is. It came out from the problem that the optimal control for this class of problems. When you have a, a linear, it's called linear quadratic regulator, which means you have a linear time invariant system, you have a quadratic cost function, and you're 
solving a, regulator pro a regulation problem. Then it naturally came out from the math that the optimal solution was to do state feedback with the weight that, uh, with the gain, the feedback gain that had a particular structure that we derived last time. Um, so this, what does it tell us? That tell us? It means that that's the best way to do control if you set your performance metric in the way we did. I mean, it's better than any fancy nonlinear crazy thing that comes to your mind. Okay, that's the best way of doing it. Uh, one note: optimal uh, in common language means the best that there is. Technically, optimal doesn't mean the best there is. It's the best there is given the performance metric. If you change the performance metric, of course, the optimal solution changes. So it's not like the first time you see the optimal controller, you're done because that's the best thing there is forever in life, right? So uh, LQR was nice. It had this state feedback uh, uh, property. Um, under some particular condition, it worked. If the state, were, if the system was uh, controllable and sorry, stabilizable and detectable. And all of this is great, right? I, I'm, I'm saying today I'll say at least seven times that's the plan. That state feedback is great. In case you you, you want to write it down, so that. Um, it's great, but what's the catch? The catch is that we don't know the state, right? <laughs> By definition of how a linear time invariant system is, you've got the measured output, which is what you can actually measure, that's what you know, that is the y, not the x. So the question arises spontaneously, and it is uh, how can we reconstruct the x, and under which conditions is it even possible? And it's something that's called the estimation problem, and it's something that we're going to deal with today. So. Just a summary, um, LQR, what's it all about? It's about finding the input that we define in a window that goes from, a time window that goes from the origin of times to infinity. Now, this is called an infinite horizon or steady state LQR problem. It's not the, the only way you can do it, okay? You can actually just to say, no, I don't want at steady state my control to work but maybe I want it to be effective over some, some horizon. No? So if you change that integral uh, 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 term to, to 0 to t, then actually the solution changes. Okay, now we're not going to deal with that, but keep in mind that we're solving the steady state solution to the problem. So we make our usual assumptions. We say our state has uh, our known dynamics. We've got some initial conditions. We are interested in controlling some uh, uh, specific outputs z. That could be any combination of the states, not necessarily uh, what you get to measure. And uh, under some, uh, some, kind, some assumptions, in particular, the weights of the different channels in the cost function need to be uh, positive definite functions, and, uh, and this is necessary to keep the, 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 the um, cost function quadratic, and uh, uh, having a quadratic cost function is a good thing because it means there is an optimal solution. Um, then we uh, arrived at the conclusion that, uh, as mentioned before, the optimal um, uh, control is in the form of state feedback, that is minus kx, where k is this uh, fancy matrix that depends on the choice of the different weights. So the weights are the design parameters in this, in this control problem. It's something you can play around with. And uh, today we're going to give an intuition even on how to, what is a rational choice of, uh, of these weights. Unfortunately, there is no golden rule. There is no optimal choice of the weights to get the best possible controller, but there are some, let's say, rules of thumbs that allow us to proceed in the, in the uh, design. So what's the catch, unfortunately, and uh, the reason for all the uh, ugly or beautiful, depending on the point of view, math we did last time, is that the uh, uh, feedback gain depends on this function, on this matrix P. And this matrix P is derived by solving a uh, um, algebraic Riccati equation that it's, uh, that it's a little bit uh, uh, tricky to solve. So um, uh, last time we didn't really have time to finish the class. I would like to go through quickly the, um, the things that we did not talk about. So don't get afraid by lots of math. Math is your friend. Math is what saves you from being undecided. You just need to sit down, do your calculation, and everything works all the time under the right hypothesis. So um, how do we solve an algebraic Riccati equation? How do we find the P matrix such that we can actually compute the gain of the steady state feedback LQR controller? Well, first, you could, there, there, there are two methods of doing it, maybe even more, but two are the standard ways of doing it. First, the um, more theoretical one. So you start by building the Hamiltonian matrix. So some of you uh, commented that the Hamiltonian matrix is a mess. Uh, we had to introduce this fancy thing. Uh, maybe I have not stressed it, but it uh, really is just uh, another way of writing the algebraic Riccati equation. It doesn't come from above for any um, weird reason we didn't mention. 
It's literally if you take this equation and you write it down in a matrix form by pre and post multiplying by a combination of identity matrices and P, you get this big matrix at the center. And that's, called the, that's, that, that's how you define the Hamiltonian matrix. So we just look at the Hamiltonian matrix, we know our weights, we build the matrix, and we know that this uh, is a 2n by 2n matrix, okay? So where n, of course, is the dimension of the state space. So uh, um, once we have this matrix, it's a matrix like all other matrices in the world, uh, we can easily compute the eigenvalues. Uh, we find the eigenvalues of the, of the Hamiltonian, we take the eigenvalues that are uh, in the, uh, associated in the left-hand left plane, the open left-hand plane, that means the, the ones that are associated to the stable modes, we compute the associated eigen, eigenvectors. So let's just call uh, v1, v2, vn the eigenvectors that have to that are associated with the uh, stable poles. And how do I know that they're n? Well, because uh, we have shown that the Hamiltonian matrix is. We know that the Hamiltonian matrix is a 2n by 2n, and we have shown that it's uh, it has uh, symmetric eigenvalues with respect to the imaginary axis. So we made an assumption, we said, hey, all of this works if and only if there are no um, uh, eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian matrix that lie exactly on the, on the imaginary axis. Well, if that hypothesis holds, then necessarily, since because of the argument of symmetry, you will have n positive and n negative, uh, um, I mean, n eigenvalues that are in the right-hand plane and n that are in the left-hand plane. So we take these n eigenvectors associated with the, the uh, stable eigenvalues, we just stack them up, as simple as that, and then we partition the stacked up matrix in a way that we can uh, define these two x1 and x2 uh, components. Once we have these x1 and x2 components, if we did all our construction well, then the x1 part is going to be invertible, and we can directly compute the uh, solution with this equation. So this is a recipe, it's a standard method, it requires building some, uh, some, uh, some uh, um, reconstructing some of the structure of the Hamiltonian matrix, but keep in mind that all these methods, LQR, LQG, that we're going to see today, uh, they're not really meant to be solved by hand. That's kind of the whole point of, the, of these control approaches. It allows you to focus on the big picture. They're, they're always going to use some, some, some computer program to solve this stuff, especially if, if you're controlling a system that has a big state space, it has a big N, it's, it becomes uh, uh, tedious, to say the least, to actually manually control all this stuff. Uh, but then unless uh, when you're going to use any subroutine available in any uh, program to do all of this, uh, these are exactly the passages that are going to happen in behind the hood. So what's the other alternative? The other alternative is just to solve it in the good old-fashioned way that is by hand. And so let's look at a, a, an example of uh, uh, both these approaches. So um, let me see here. So what's the first way of doing this? The first way of doing this is by... Um, ha, I cannot choose these two like this. Okay. Maybe I can. Sorry a sec. Okay, so let's look at an example. Let's say we are given our system x dot equals ax plus bu. Of course, this is x, a, and this is b. Now, uh, we decide what the cost function is. Remember, the cost function is something that is up to the designer, and we choose it to be the sum of uh, the uh, sum one of the states and the input cost equally weighed. So from this, by inspection, comparing with the uh, theory, we can directly compute the uh, q r and n matrices. So by doing this, uh, then we have to, the first step is checking if the uh, stabilizability and detectability conditions are verified. So how do we check if the system is stabilizable? Well, uh, we know that the system is controllable if uh, um, the rank of the controllability matrix is equal to the state space dimension, right? So you might recall that the controllability matrix is defined in this way, and so we can just build it up by inspection. We know the B matrix is 1, 0, 
and then we just look at A, and we have to do A times B, so you just look at rows times columns, you get a nice one up here, and you get a zero times a zero here. So it's easy to see that the rank of this matrix is, uh, um, is equal to one, that is unfortunately less than two. What does this tell us? This tells us that the system is not uh, controllable. But controllable, what does it mean? Controllable means that the input cannot access all the different modes of the system. We don't care to access all the modes of the system. We want the system to be stabilizable. Stabilizable means we want to be able to check, to control, to reach only the unstable modes, because the other ones are already stable. So yeah, sure, we won't be able to set the performances that we want, but we will still be able to stabilize the system. So I'm not sure if you know about this or not from previous uh, classes, but um, if I were to ask you, how do you find uh, 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 which is the stable mode and which is the unstable mode once you have assessed that the system is not fully controllable? There's something called the PBH test, uh, the popov belevich hautus I hope I pronounced this correctly, but it's commonly known as the Hautus test, uh, that basically tells us that if we construct the matrix uh, uh, lambda i minus a, where lambda, of course, is the eigenvalues of a, sorry, it's the eigenvalues of the reachability matrix, uh, then uh, uh, if uh, this matrix will have rank equal to n, which is the state space, uh, for all the reachable modes. So if we uh, check this test only for the modes that are unstable, then uh, it will tell us if the system is stabilizable. That is, if we have the power to actually go and modify the unstable poles. You can try this uh, at home and you will see that uh, actually the unstable mode, which is the one, if we look at the uh, eigenvalues of R, and we just do lambda i minus R, and we look at the determinant, this comes out to be lambda minus one, minus one, zero, lambda. The determinant is equal to lambda minus one, lambda equal to zero. This has two solutions, of course. One is lambda equal to zero, the other one is lambda equal to one. Lambda equal to one has a positive real part, which means it's the, uh, uh, the, the, the prime suspect, it's the unstable pole. And uh, if we construct this matrix and plug in lambda equal to one, you will see that the rank is equal to n, which tells us that the system is stabilizable. So check on the first condition. What about the second one? Second one asks us if the system is detectable. Uh, the system is detectable if uh, um, the unstable modes associated with observability are, uh, um, are, are, are detectable. So we can just check for observability. We will talk about observability in detail today, on some detail today, but we saw last time that it has a very similar um, relationship to, to reachability. You have to check the rank of the observability matrix, and this has to be equal to n for the system to be observable. The observability matrix is defined as uh, uh, C, CA, um, in this case, of having n equal to 2, and you'll see that the rank of this is actually equal to 2, which means that our system is ob observable. If it's observable, it's definitely detectable. So how do we proceed from here? Well, if we... Yes, sir. Yes. So no, no, no. So uh, it's a way of saying when you say a system is stabilizable, it means uh, you're checking for the pair AB. So that's a notation that is typically used to, instead of writing x dot equals ax plus bu, you just say the AB pair. Okay, and if the AB pair is, control, is, is reachable, controllable, whatever it is, that means that the associated reachability matrix, which is the one obtained by stacking up things in the appropriate way, uh, is reachable. And we will use this even for observability, typically, or you say, yeah, if the pair AC is observable, then that means you have to build up an observability matrix that is uh, um, the CCA up to CAN minus one. So how do we proceed from here? Well, we have to build the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian, well, uh, we have some definitions from before on, uh, on uh, how, how the different terms look like. And I just uh, uh, repeated them here for, for, for ease of uh, construction. And what we're really doing is just plugging in the numbers. So we know what A is. We know that N is equal to zero. By the way, N equal to zero, we will see that is, um, it is an actually very wise choice uh, uh, in most cases. Um, it's a good design choice because it allows us to guarantee some robustness properties of LQR, as we will see in a few slides from now. So 
in this particular example, n is equal to zero, so these parts go away, this part goes away, we can simply compute the different matrices, and then we stack them up. And we get this as the Hamiltonian matrix. I am not, of course, going to uh, evaluate the eigenvalues of this matrix by hand, but you can use any, any of your favorite tools to do so. And you'll see that it has four eigenvalues, lambda 1, 2, 3, and 4, two of which, as we expect, are stable because they have a negative real part, and the other two are not. So what do we do? We just uh, uh, take the eigenvalues that are uh, the eigenvectors that are associated with the stable uh, poles, and uh, we stack them up. So this is V1 and V3, and you will notice that, in fact, this is V1 and this is V3. What would we do? We'd literally just place them one next to each other. No operation involved here. But then we know, look, if we partition this matrix in the way that we saw, so we just consider the top part as uh, um, the x1 and the bottom part as the x2, then we can simply uh, uh, apply the, the, the result we have, invert x1, do the calculations, and we get a result. Done. We found uh, p. Once you find p, then the state feedback law is just u minus kx, with k that is given by uh, the equations that we saw before. Now, is there another way of doing this? Yes, you can do the, uh, the, the solving by hand method, we call it for lack of better uh, terms. So what does this really mean? It means that you spell out the algebraic... Yes, ma'am. No, it doesn't. If you switch the order of uh, rows and columns of a matrix, you're not going to change it. So. Right. Okay, so um, how do you solve this by hand? So in order to solve this by hand, we have to remember some of the properties that, uh, of, of the solution of the matrix Riccati equation that stem from uh, choosing the reachability and detectability conditions as we did. And to make it short, the P matrix will be symmetric and it will be definite, uh, positive definite. So we start by saying, okay, let's impose a symmetric P. And we don't know what the P is. That's the whole point of this exercise is finding P. But we just spell out its, its, its components, P1, P2, P3, and P4. Then we build the algebraic Riccati equation. How do we do it? Well, we have the definition from the uh, definition of the system and the cost function. We know what the A, R, and Q matrices are. And we just build it up like this, okay? So you'll see that this is the uh, A matrix, this, so the A tilde that happened to be equal to A because of the choice of the specific weights. And we have all the different P's, uh, uh, the different P matrices going around. So this is A transpose P plus PA minus uh, PR inverse uh, uh, P equal to Q. I brought just the minus Q on the other side. And how do you do this now? So Although this looks a little bit nasty, it really isn't, because if you start doing the various computations, let's see if I can do this with two pages as intended. Yes. So let's look at this and focus element by element. Okay, so now we're looking only at the top left elements. If we do the multiplications, Let's do the products of the first matrix. Row times columns, row times columns. So it's 1, 0 times P1, P2. It becomes P1. Then the second element is P2. The third one is P1 minus P2. Bottom right is P2 minus P3. Plus, do the multiplications there. What do we get? We get P1 in the top left corner. We, we get... Um, we get uh, um, P1 minus P2 here. Please check my math. It's possible that I do mistakes. It's P2 here, and it's P2 minus P3 here. Minus here we have the quadratic terms, so we'll just do the product of the first two, which is easy. It's P1 here, 0 here, P2 here, and uh, 0 here, times P1, P2, P2, P3. Keep in mind that we imposed the P matrix to be symmetric, right? So the, the off-diagonal terms are, of course, this equal. This has to be equal to what? To minus 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay? So we just need to uh, calculate now the second matrix. So we'll just copy out the first ones. 
P2, P1 minus P2, P2 minus P3, plus P1, P1 minus P2, P2, P2 minus P3, minus what goes on here? Well, we've got a P1 square up here, we've got a P1, P2 here, a P1, P2 here as well, and a P2 square here, and this is equal always to minus one, zero, zero. Now, what do I mean by focus element by element? Now, these are just the sums of, of, of matrices, right? Sums and subtraction of matrices, it's an element by element operation. So if we just focus on, the, uh, on these uh, top left corner, for example, what this matrix is telling, what this, this matrix equation is telling us is that P1 plus P1 minus P1 square has to be equal to minus one, okay? And you can literally do this now for four of these. Uh, you have four, four, four components, so you can write out four equations and simply solve the, the outstanding uh, system by hand. And this is what we do here. So if we, um, if we do it for all four matrices, for all four elements, we'll see that there are only three uh, linearly independent equations, which are these three. We can, uh, by your favorite method, find out what P1, P2, and P3 are, and you will then get two P solutions. Remember that there is not a unique solution to the uh, matrix Riccati equation, but there is a unique positive definite solution. So how do you choose between the outstanding P matrices, which one is the one that we care about? You just go and look what the positive, uh, positive definite one is. And how do you evaluate if a matrix is positive definite? You might recall uh, from last class, we introduced the Sylvester criterion as one of the methods to do it. And the Sylvester criterion told us that for a matrix to be positive definite, we want all the, print, the leading principal minors to be positive. And uh, the leading principal minors are the ones that build on the main diagonal. And we can tell right away from looking at P2 that since the first leading principal minor is the top left corner, this is a negative number, therefore P2 cannot be positive definite, therefore we found our solution, which is P1. And lucky us, it's exactly the same as the previous method, okay? So there's no uh, big mystery behind the algebraic matrix equations. It's just a matter of being patient and solving them. Are there any comments, questions, and doubts, or doubts on this? It's important to understand how to solve them. No? Nope. Perfect. Okay, so... A small comment on how to choose the weights. Um, we saw that the design parameters of this, of this controller are the weights themselves, right? There is no golden way to determine what the best ones are, as we did before, but there are some, some relatively smart ways of doing it. Uh, so the way you typically do it in practice is you just make the matrices diagonal, you just multiply them all by a weight, and uh, that makes life easy because diagonal matrices are nice, and uh, so literally you Decide Q to be, for example, equal to small Q times I. R is going to be equal to small R times I. And you see what the solution is. You check if it's, you're happy with it. If not, you start iterating manually on the numbers until you're happy. That's, that's really what goes on. Um, a, a little bit more of a, of a, of a smart uh, solution is using something that's called the Byron's rule. And here, like, you have to uh, be a little bit careful on... Uh, on uh, um, understanding how the mathematical machinery behind a, um, a minimization problem works. So if we have uh, a cost function that is equal to... Can you see up there? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. If you have a cost function that is equal to the integral of A plus B, okay, whatever these are, and you're asking... Uh, you're solving a minimization problem. So you're saying, ah, let's say this is AX plus B, and you're saying, I want to find... the the minimum over x of j, right? And this we call it the j optimal. But, uh, all that the, the math behind it is doing is finding the combination of x such that this number is small, okay? So let's say in a practical situation, you are, these a and b mean something to us. Maybe this, I don't know, is a length and this is a uh, temperature, right? If you measure temperatures in Celsius and you have maybe this is a number in the order of 10, Okay, and you measure this number here instead in millimeters just because uh, this is going to be in the order of uh, thousands, okay, so, or even more. So what I'm saying is the choice of the numbers you plug in will determine the way the, 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 the cost function 
that at least the minimization problem uh, uh, um, evolves. So it is a wise choice uh, to have a balanced uh, to have a balance between the different terms that compose a cost function. So what Byron rules, rule says is just choose your weights so that whatever, diff, whatever um, uh, measuring unit you used to, to evaluate uh, the different terms, you normalize them. So you choose the RIs, the scale, scale, scalar weights on your diagonal matrices such that you just divide by the maximum admissible number of the, relevant, uh, of the, of the respective terms. For example, the um, the, 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 the inputs and the allowable um, of the controlled uh, outputs. So again, that's not, uh, doesn't guarantee anything, but uh, at least you have a balance between the two terms and the system is going to be more, more numerically um, balanced. And again, then you get a solution, you check, you see if you like it, if you don't like it, you continue iterating. So a quick analysis on uh, what's going on. So let's make an assumption. This is just a recap of what we did before. No need to, to see it again. I will, uh, the slide is, appears a number of times in the presentation just because we don't want to just scroll back 20 times to see what's going, what's going on. If you select n to be equal to 0, you can guarantee some robustness properties of LQR. And the nice thing is that LQR comes out to be extremely robust. It's really beautiful in the sense that it is possible to show that if you have a choice of n equal to zero, and of course you respect the various hypotheses that lead us to finding a state feedback solution for the linear quadratic regulator problem, then you can have infinite positive gain, uh, a negative gain mar sorry, infinite positive gain margin, a negative gain margin of 6 dBs, which is, uh, uh, which is, which is significant. You, have, uh, you remember, of course, from control systems one, what the gain margin and the phase margin are, right? So the gain margin is uh, how much can you crank up your feedback again before the system goes unstable. If you have an infinite positive gain margin, and by the way, the higher the, the gain is typically the more, uh, the better performances, tracking performances you have. So cranking up the gain margin infinitely is typically a very nice uh, thing. A phase margin was defined uh, in a little bit more of an obscure manner. Uh, let's say that the phase margin is, uh, um, when you study control systems one and you look at CISO systems, you can wrap up the, the meaning of the gain margin by saying it's, it's, it's a measure of robustness and it says how much can your model parameters be off before the system goes unstable. So uh, for practical purposes, when you design a system, you typically require the gain margin to be roughly bigger than 40, 45 degrees. Uh, so having a, a guaranteed phase margin through this automatic control method of 60 degrees is, is really impressive. And it can be shown that, that uh, uh, LQR is really robust to, uh, to some, sort, some, some forms of model uncertainty, as we've seen in previous classes. So um, in the interest of time, I will not prove uh, the stability, although you have an exact derivation here, so you can check it at home. But I would like to just introduce quickly this concept of Lyapunov functions, which uh, are, are literally an extraordinarily simple, but at the same time powerful tool to check for stability of systems. It's uh, arguably the favorite tool uh, to use in analyzing nonlinear systems. You will see uh, in a couple of classes um, how, how, to, how to deal with nonlinear systems a little bit. But um, for now, just, just take it at face value and uh, imagine that uh, we can build a function, B, that um, has an associated quadratic form that is positive. That means that B is a positive definite function, it's something that always grows. Um, as the state, uh, uh, as, as, as a function of the state. And uh, the only really important thing, which is typically the pitfall for every student that works with uh, Lyapunov control functions, so write this down because you don't want to get it wrong in the exam, uh, you have to define a, 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 a Lyapunov function that is a function of all the states of your system. And it has to be equal to zero only when x is equal to zero. If you, because the way you define your Lyapunov function is completely arbitrary. There is no rule. You can choose what it is, as long as it's Positive definite, and it includes all the weights of the system, all the states of the system, all the x from 1 to n. Uh, so once we have this function, um, well, well, what does the Lyapunov stability theorem say? It says, well, if you evaluate its derivative, and uh, the derivative is always negative, it's at least the quadratic form associated with the uh, derivative of v is uh, negative definite, then uh, 
your system is guaranteed to be stable. If it's strictly negative, it's asymptotically stable. If it's uh, non strictly negative, it's marginally stable or stress stable. So what does this V mean? This V, mean, this v can be imagined as an energy function, like the energy of the system. And uh, the V dot is uh, how does the energy of the system evolve as X evolves, so as the state dynamics just goes around in time. So I guess it's intuitive. The intuitive way of looking at it is uh, if we show that uh, uh, there is a certain energy in the system and we guarantee that this energy is equal to zero at some equilibrium point, where the system will eventually converge if it's stable. Then if uh, we show, we prove that uh, the evolution of this energy is always negative, well, what does it mean? It means there's no energy added to the system. If there's no energy added to the system, it can't blow up, it can't go unstable. That's, that's the intuition behind it. So as simple as it is, we can define it in some, in such, in some way here. Typically, you get away with it by just saying x transpose px. But, uh, but I don't want to get into this into, in the interest of time, but please do the calculations. You will notice that uh, the whole point is finding that V will be always negative if this term here is negative. Uh, or sorry, it's positive, and this guarantee, that shows us what the gain margins are. And for the proof of the other robustness properties, you can refer to the references. So, okay, we finally got to the beginning of the class today. Um, I already talked about what, is, what are the problems. The problems are that state feedback is great, but we don't know the state. We need to figure out the state. How do we figure out the state? Well, we play with what we have. There's only two things that we really know apart from the state when we have a linear time invariant system that is given to us. One is the output, the other one is the input. There really are no other choices. So the estimation problem, uh, which is the, the problem of, of uh, determining the evolution of the states from a system, um, is the problem of uh, finding what the x's are if you have the knowledge of all the inputs, and that typically is known because the inputs come from us, we choose them, we design the controllers, so that's not a big deal, and if you can measure the outputs, which of course are given to us by definition because they're measured. A note on terminology. Um, here, we're opening a can of worms, the traditional can of worms. Estimation is a big field. You have dedicated courses on estimation. Um, but sometimes, so there's, depending on how the problem is formulated, you'll find the different words to describe it. Uh, estimation is typically an umbrella term. Uh, but the idea is, if you know the inputs and you know the measurements, are you evaluating the states at this current time instant? Okay, then it's called filtering problem. Or and, and, and the machinery that does the filtering problem is called an observer. If instead, always through the same problem formulation, that is, you have your inputs and you have your outputs, you want to find an estimate of the state, but in the past, and it's called the smoothing problem. And it's typically used if uh, you have noisy data and you want to try to, uh, to, to extract what's, what's actually going on beyond the noise. Uh, if instead, you pose exactly the same problem, but you're interested in knowing what the states in the future are, then it's called a prediction problem. So if you hear or read in different books, ah, oh, the, 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 the prediction, the, the smoothing, the filtering, they're all the, basically the same thing. They all come from the same problem formulation. It's just that you're solving for a different variable, either at this instant, previous, or past. What are we interested in? We saw that our state feedback laws are minus kxx at this time instant, so we're going to solve filtering problems. Uh, and in fact, a filter or an observer are typically synonyms. So do not get, or an estimator, an observer, and a filter are typically uh, synonyms. So how are we going to deal with, uh, um, with uh, uh, we have one minute, it's enough to talk about observability. So a system, this is a definition, so let's read it out. A system is said to be observable if uh, for any choice of time that is positive, and uh, uh, it is possible to determine the state of the system at the current time through the measurements of inputs and outputs. And uh, what is the intuition? The intuition is that from uh, uh, just looking at the output of your system, you're guaranteed that there are no hidden dynamics. There's nothing going on in the background that you cannot tell by just looking at the output. This is the intuition behind observability. And by the way, why did it come out from the LQR problem that the system needed to be observable? Well, because we defined a performance metric and uh, the whole deal was minimizing that performance metric. 
Now, if the performance metric that is based on output doesn't see the hidden states, how can it minimize them? How can it operate on them? So detectability in that case was required because uh, the uh, performance metric that we defined in, with that assumption was able to capture the evolution of all the possible states, thus preventing, for example, one of the states going to infinity while the cost function remaining a finite quantity. So, unless there are questions, comments or doubts, you can take a break. Okay, let's get back to business. Um, hello? Errata, I said uh, uh, something wrong. And I would just like to correct it right away. It's important, I said something wrong, we need to fix it before we continue. When you go and look at the... Um, when we go check for a stabilizability, the lambda in that equation is not the eigenvalue of R, it's the eigenvalue of A, of course, okay? And it, I was lucky when I did the calculations because the unstable one is always, has the same value, it's always one. But you have, lambdas are the eigenvalues of A, not the eigenvalues of R, okay? So let me just add it here for future reference. This has to be A, okay? Okay then, uh, back to where were we? So, um, so, the observability. We know already that the observability test comes from uh, constructing that matrix. Why is the matrix like this? Have you ever thought about it? Well, because uh, what do we want to do? We want to reconstruct the state from the output, right? So, say we have x dot equals ax plus bu and y equals cx. Are there comments, questions, or doubts? So uh, we are assuming by definition of the estimation problem that the input is known. Since it's known, it makes sense just for simplicity of argument to consider it equal to zero, because it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, you know it, you can remove it, okay? We'll see this happening later. But let's consider just the system x dot equals ax and uh, y is equal to cx. Again, I'm removing the u part because by definition of the problem, we know what u is. Where does this uh, uh, observability matrix come from? Well, what do we want to do? We want to find x as a function of y. Look, we have y, y equals to cx, right? <laughs> Can't we just uh, do x equals to c inverse y? Done. And uh, what's the big deal about uh, estimation, right? So, yeah, of course, you can do it. If uh, C emits an inverse, this is the solution of the problem. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's math never lies. So, uh, but it turns out that in most of the cases, this, is, this will not happen. So, if you want to generalize a little bit, how, how do you get to that matrix? You say, okay, I've got Y that is equal to uh, CX. Let's suppose we're dealing with a CISO system, okay? So CISO system, what does it mean? It means we have uh, X that is an N by one, we've got Y that is a one by one, it's a single output, and U we don't really care. So this means Y is a one by one, X is a N by one, therefore C has to be what? It has to be a one by N, correct? It's, it's, it's a row uh, vector. So, Okay, uh, we want to invert this thing. I can't invert a row vector, so what if instead I look at y dot? y dot is cx dot, right? And cx dot is an ugly way of saying cax, correct? I just applied the definition of the system. Uh, what is a ca? Well, same argument as before, ca is always a row vector. If you put a row vector and another row vector, you've got two row vectors. Unless uh, it becomes a square matrix, you still can't invert it. So if I continue doing this game up to the nth derivative, well, what we get is that this is going to be equal to CA minus 1 times X. Now, put all of these together. Stack all Y, Y dot, up to YN. And express them all as a function of X. What do you get? You get C, CA, blah, blah, blah. Ah, C. Actually, sorry. 
Uh, let's pretend that this is not an n. Let's pretend that we take up to the, I don't know, L derivative of y, whatever L is. We'll figure it out later. So this is Cl minus 1, okay? So n is, a, x is, we said, an n by 1. Here, y is a 1 by 1. We stacked up L uh, y's, so we got an L by 1. Um, now, we want to figure out uh, what, what is going to be the dimension of this. It's going to be an L by n. So the whole point, now we can recognize here that if we were to be able, yes. CA to the power L. But think about that. So from the first equation, it's so y. It's the uh, let's say the first derivative of the. It, it's if you take y on its own, you it's a c. About, we can we can do the calculations. Y is equal cx. Y dot is equal cx dot, which is ca times x. Y dot that y double dot is equal to ca x dot, which is c uh, a square x, right? So, um, okay, so I take the m minus 1 derivative here, good? <laughs> l minus 1, good, good point, thank you for pointing it out. So, and in fact, this now is an l by 1 because it's l minus 1 plus the original, thank you very much. So, this doesn't Take away from the point that we now we have this big matrix here that is uh, uh, C, C, A up to C, A to the power L minus 1, which is an L by M matrix. We want to invert it, but we like inverting um, square matrices because we know that square matrices are easy to invert. So in order to make this square, we choose L to be equal to N. And therefore, this becomes an M by M matrix. And uh, it's a C, C, A up to, to C, A to the n minus 1, which is what we defined to be the observability matrix. So the, observab the, the fact that the rank of the observability matrix needs to be equal to n, which is the definition, of, this is the definition of observability, it just comes out from the fact that you need to stack up at least uh, uh, n derivatives of the uh, n, minus, sorry, n derivatives of the n minus 1 derivatives of the output in order to construct this this square matrix that then, if it has rank n, you can invert and you can find x as a function of y, which is the whole point. Can we do the same thing for discrete time systems? Yes. So, but of course here you have to be a little bit more careful because remember that when you discretize a system, a is no longer the same a as before, right? It's the a of the discretized version. You all remember from class two how to, how to discretize a system. But if you follow the same procedure, that is you write y of 1, or let's say just y of k, up to y of k plus n, you will get exactly the same thing. You'll get c, c, a, up to c, a, n minus 1, x, okay? Um, you can do this as an exercise, it's trivial. But that's the origin of the observability matrix. So just before we continue, I'm not sure if you've ever seen this, this, this graph before, but I, I find it nice. So. When you have a system, you can always break it down to its structural properties, it's called, which is basically, uh, um, this is your, your system, okay? It's your P, your x dot equals ax plus bu. And it's always the union of four different components, which, of course, any one of these could be just empty if you want. But in the general case, there's going to be a reachable and an observable one, then reachable, non-observable, and all the various combinations. What does it mean? If you have a reachable and observable, the, the reachable and observable subsystem of a system is something that can be touched, affected, influenced by the inputs and can be seen by the outputs. So you see there's the U arrow getting in and the Y arrow getting out. Now, if you have a part of a subsystem that is reachable but it's not observable, what does it mean? It means you can touch it with your inputs, you can affect it with your inputs, but the outputs don't see what is going on. Please note that all the different subsystems communicate with each other. So if we go and affect the reachable and observable one, there is a cascade of effects inside the, given by the A matrix between the all different the subsystems. And maybe something here is going unstable. Maybe here there is a, something that is going to infinity. But if we cannot reach it with the input, 
means we'll never be able to place that pole. We'll never be able to change that behavior. But at the same time, if it's not observable, we won't even see it. Okay? This is the famous uh, uh, terror of, uh, of uh, pole zero cancellation. They told you at some point, don't ever cancel an unstable pole and unstable zero. Why? Because you're putting it in here. You're putting it in the uh, non-reachable, non-observable part. You can't affect it, you can't see it, but it's still there. It's going to blow up. Okay? So you can always imagine the different subspaces to be in this way. And in the same way we uh, defined uh, uh, um, uh, how to test for stabilizability, we can define a, a how to test for detectability, which is just uh, flipping out, uh, around the matrices. And why are we flipping around the matrices? Because there's a beautiful thing between controllability and estimation that is called the duality of these two problems, and we will see it in detail today. So finally, we get to the state estimation problem. Let's suppose that we have a, uh, going back to your thing, you see now I'm, I'm getting bored, I don't want to write x dot equals x plus bu all the time, so let's give in a a, b, c, d pair, or, or tuplet, whatever it is. Uh, what does it mean? It means a system x dot equals a x plus bu and y equals a cx plus du. We want, by supposing that we know the inputs and we can measure the outputs, we want to reconstruct the state at the current time instant, okay? And possibly we want to reconstruct it through an estimate that we call x hat in such a way that the estimate eventually will match our, our, our real state. That is, the, tra the estimation error, the difference between x and x hat, has to asymptotically go to zero. That's really what we're saying. Let's try to create somehow a, a machinery that produces an estimate of the state called x hat that eventually, as t goes to infinity, it will converge to the true state. Okay? How are we going to go about doing it? Uh, so the idea here is that uh, we create a numerical copy of the system. Because we know what the, what the model is, A, B, C, D. We know what the inputs are. And we can measure the outputs. So forget about the outputs for now. Suppose that you just know the input and you just know the model. The red part is the actual plant, okay? That's the real system that's, that's, that's happening. You get an input. There's the first equation, the second equation. Note that the state is, is not available to us. We can't measure the state. We measure only the output. The only thing that comes out of that red block is the y. But what if, in parallel, on our computer, we create a virtual system that a numerical copy, numerical means it has to do with computers, a copy of the system that has the same exact dynamics. It's driven by the same exact input. Well, uh, if I have the same exact initial condition, it's going to be a perfect match. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it doesn't really matter if in the first equation there we call x x or we call it uh, z or flower or house, right? If it's related uh, to the other mathematical objects in the equation in the same way, well, the evolution of x is going to be the same as, as, as the other one. So if A and B are exactly as the one of the observer, are exactly as the, one, uh, as the ones of the system, and it's driven by the same input, well, you got a state estimate that if the initial conditions are correct, it's going to work. So how do we know if it's going to work, if it's going to be asymptotically stable? Well, let's look at the error, the tracking error, which is what we want to send to zero. Let's evaluate the dynamic of the tracking error. How do you do that? Well, you take the derivative. No, we're, we're dealing with linear time invariant systems. It's all about x dot equal. In this case, we do e dot. What is e dot equal to? e dot is equal to x dot minus x hat dot. If you just plug in the two definitions that are there, you'll see that the b part and the b part cancel out. That's why typically when you see estimation problems, people just say, yeah, forget about the b, okay? Because uh, forget about the u. The u is known, so it will always cancel out. So you get a x minus x hat, which is equal to a times e. So you've got the dynamic of the error, the, the estimation error, that is e dot equals a e. What does it mean? It means that your state, sorry, your state estimate will converge to your real state, that is, the tracking error is going to go to zero, when? And the eigenvalues of the a matrix are uh, in the left-hand plane. It's the same concept of stability that we've seen a thousand times. 
uh, we've seen before, if you have x dot equals ax, when is x dot equals ax is stable? When a is stable, when a has eigenvalues in the left-hand plane. So if we have e dot e dot that is equal to ae, when, it's gonna, when is, it go to, is it going to go to zero? When the eigenvalues of a are in the left-hand plane. Now, all good and dandy, but what if a is not stable, right? Well, we still have another tool. We have the y. So the first one was called the, um, uh, it's an open loop observer, okay? An open loop observer works if your system is inherently stable. If your, your system is inherently stable, doesn't, you don't need to do anything to, to, to reconstruct it. You just need to build a numerical copy of it and feed it the same input that you feed to your, actually, to your actual system. Now, what instead, and here comes the fun part, we want to fix. So we saw that we can do pole placement on A, right? How do you do pole placement? You, you have to uh, reach it with the, uh, uh, with the state somehow. But here we can't use the state because that's the whole point of the problem is we don't have the state. But we have the, the output. The output itself won't help very much. But boom, here comes an, uh, internal model control. Here comes the idea of what if we feed back only the uncertainty of the system? What if we feed back only the difference between what we think is the actual system, y hat, what is the actual output, it's the predicted output, y hat, that you obtain by using the model of the system that it's given to us, and you take the difference between y hat and y, okay? And you add a term to your estimator. You say the estimator is a numerical copy of my, of my system, as before, but this time it's driven, that is, it has an extra, see it as an extra input. And in fact, it's represented as an extra input. It's driven by the innovation. It's driven by the, what we called before the uncertainty term. Okay? So what happens if we do this? Well, you, can, you crank through the math. You see that x has this form. Uh, you do the same thing as before. Our objective is sending to zero the estimation error. So we evaluate the dynamics of the estimation error in the form of e dot equal and e dot is equal to x dot minus x hat dot, plug in the equations, you'll see that the b terms cancel out. We have a x minus x hat plus lc x minus x hat. Bring everything together. What does this remind you of? It looks damn close to an a plus bx of pole placement, right? But it's an a minus lc. You'll notice that when we were doing pole placement through state feedback, we had a, what was it, minus... Uh, bk, right? Yes, no, maybe? Yes, thank you. So a minus bk, now we have, so, and we were choosing k. Now it's kind of different, it's very similar, like the intuition says, look, we will be able to place the poles of the A matrix in the estimation problem, so in the sense of, of affecting the dynamics of the estimation error. It's, we can't just use immediately the results we had from before because the order of B and, uh, and so of K and L, which are the gains we have to, the, we have to determine, are inverted. Uh, I didn't mention, L is called the estimation gain, okay? So what we're doing is we are making a numerical copy of the system, we're driving it from uh, the innovation term, which is the difference between our prediction and our actual measurement, very powerful idea that comes from internal model control, and then we're multiplying it by a gain, because why not, no? It's always good to put a gain there. You can always put it to one if you don't like it. So, and we get A minus LC, that is nice. And this is a beautiful, beautiful thing that happens. Let's now put a mirror and look at things one by one, okay? On one side, we have state feedback. We knew that state feedback, if we did state feedback in the way we introduced it, you get at the end the closed loop performance of the system, that is X dot equals A minus BK X. We do the things we just described, and um, by the way, forgot to say, this is called the Leuenberger Observer. The Leuenberger Observer works in practice, it's beautiful, it it's, 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 has a name. Typically stuff that has a name, it's, it's the stuff you want to remember. And by the way, Leuenberger is a still Professor Emeritus at Stanford University, uh, thriving, and uh, uh, thank you, Professor Leuenberger. Um, so let's look at control and estimation. Um, you see that the problems are very similar, but not quite the same. But we do a simple trick here. We take, so you agree with me that if this, ma if this matrix here is, uh, uh, has a stable pose, then the error dynamic goes to zero, right? Yeah, raise your hand if you agree. 
good enough. 40%, Claudio, I'll show you, but it's not good enough. <laughs> good enough, okay. Um, do you agree with me that the poles of a matrix don't change? The, the eigenvalues of a matrix don't change if you take the transpose of it? If you switch orders of lines of columns, the eigenvalues are always the same. So we can easily say, look, these two things are, are exactly the same. Let's just take the A matrix, the A minus LC, the transition matrix in the, in the, in the aerodynamics, and take the transpose of it. And uh, we're just writing it in a different way. And now we have uh, the gain that we care about that is pretty much in the same position as before. So let's pretend we just call the, the, the transposed version of this, the A transpose, we call it an A tilde. By the way, this A tilde has nothing to do with the A tilde of the, of the LQR business that we talked about before. I, I just um, have poor ideas when I use notations, but so it's just A transpose is defined as an A tilde. This C transpose, we define it as an B tilde. K trans, L transpose, we define it as a K tilde. Now we've got exactly the same problem as control, as the state, uh, as the pole placement state feedback problem we, we saw before. Therefore, we can apply all the results we knew from before just being careful to do the right substitutions with the relative terms. Now, the, we saw that pole placement worked if and only if, by the way, if, it's not a, it's not a typo, it means if and only if, uh, the rank of the reachability matrix was equal to n, right? Now, for duality, because we can do this trick with the transposes, what, is, what happens? So what, what is the equivalent, the dual condition of this reachability matrix? Let's look at the R tilde matrix. Let's plug in the B tilde, A tilde, and so on. We just substitute with, this, with, the, with, the, with, what, with the definition of before. And what do we get? We get C transpose, A transpose, C transpose, all these things transposed. And this is just the transpose of the observability matrix. The observability matrix and the controllability matrix are dual of each other. That is, they're exactly the same concept if you just take one and switch the A to A transpose and the B to C transpose. And you get the same problem. They are fundamentally, structurally the same concept. It's just that it's seen from a different perspective, from the transpose of the matrix and choosing the C instead of the B. Remember, B is always something to do with the inputs on the system because X dot equals AX plus BU. C is always something to do with the sensors, with the measurements, because Y equals CX. So estimation, which is the whole idea of can I see, can I reconstruct my states from just looking at the measurements plus knowing the, the inputs? Well, it must be a function of C because C is where you place your sensors, basically. So it's nice to see that the uh, necessary and sufficient condition for observability comes out one, like immediately from doing this consideration of duality. So we saw from our pull placement lecture last time uh, that, or was it two times ago, that uh, there was a shortcut to, to, to place the poles of the closed loop system when we had state feedback. And this shortcut, we called it the Ackermann formula. Now, does the Ackermann formula work even for deciding, for placing the poles of the observer, that is, for arbitrarily choosing the, dynamic, the dynamics of our estimator? Well, it works if we consider the dual version of it. That is, we substitute at the right spots the dual versions. So if k as the k of the state feedback was equal to this equation, the k tilde is the same thing, but with r tilde instead of r. And uh, please note that k tilde is equal to the transpose of L, of the observer gain. So this is equal to the transpose of the observer gain. If you take the transpose, you have the Ackermann formula for the observer. And this works in the same exact way as before. We will get to the point that I'm not even gonna do an exercise on this in class because it's really the same thing. You just go and take the exercise we have on state uh, uh, on pole placement that we did a couple lessons ago. You, do, you put the transposes and you'll see it's gonna come out exactly in the same way. Observers, Lewenberger observers, need to be designed. For the same principles that apply to pole placement, you get to arbitrarily place the poles of the observer. That is, you get to arbitrarily choose what the speed of convergence of your estimator is. How quickly you need, you will, yes, sir. No, because, um, it's a good question. 
Um, no. Um, I can get in detail later, maybe. I'll have to check this up, but I'm pretty confident that it's no. So, um, where does this bring us? This brings us to the fact that now we have a way to reconstruct the estimate, the, to estimate the state of the system just by looking at the outputs and the inputs by doing a numerical copy on the system and feeding back the uncertainty. Good. So, but we were talking only about estimation. And this is a very important thing that we're about to say, so focus up. Um, we discussed the estimator, okay? The estimator is how do we get this state estimate? But why are we doing these estimators? What's the whole point that brought us to, to have this class today? It's because we want to do pole placement. We want to do controls, right? But we, we saw that doing controls through the state estimate, well, through the state estimate, was really great. State estimate is great. It's the fourth, fifth time I say it. I need to get to seven. Um, works only if we have the state. We created the estimator so that we can feed back instead of minus kx, which x, you don't know it, so it's only a theoretical exercise. You can do it with minus kx hat. So we have to plug the estimator in the loop in order to actually do state feedback. So we saw that the two problems are dual. There is some nice relationship. But how do they interact with each other? If I actually want to, we saw that we can design the, 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 we can place the poles in that very easy way through the Hackerman formula or by hand. We can place the poles of the estimator in a, in a pretty much exactly the same way. Do these two partial results hold if we put everything together? Or is, it this, is there some weird interaction that we need to account for? So that's the whole point of what we're trying to do to see now. If, uh, we, so what is the, so look, look at this thing up here. What is the Lewenberger observer? This is just copy and paste from the previous slide. It's a machine that takes as input this guy here and this guy here. There's only two arrows that get into the blue box. Okay, one is the input U, and the other one is the output Y, which are the assumptions of our of our, of our thing, of our uh, estimation problem. So let's just collapse this box and make it a Lewenberger observer that receives as inputs the u's and the y's. And what does it produce as an output? It produces as an output, uh, let, let's look what gets out of here. It produces as an output the x hat, which is the whole purpose for which we created this, this business, right? Now, if we feed this back, now we've got our minus x hat, and we can do a state feedback in the sense of u is equal to minus k x hat. Now, we care to see if there is something weird going on in the coupling between this estimation and this state feedback. If using an estimate in doing state feedback creates any issue with respect to what we've seen before. How are we going to do this? We're going to study, we're going to redefine this, the internal dynamics, the state of our whole system, including control part and estimator part, stack it up and say, hey, we care about X and E. Okay, let's call this, I don't know, Z or whatever you want to call it. Z, and we used it in a different way. What's your favorite letter? C. We'll go with a C. Okay, so C is equal XE. Um, so we care to see what C dot is, okay? Because if we look at C dot, then we can tell what's the dynamic of the whole system, of the closed loop system. But of course, it has to be in closed loop, so we have to take into account all the different equations. So. If we define, okay, I called it x tilde, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, point well taken. So x tilde is equal to xe. Uh, if we take the dot of it and we go and check the dynamics, what's going to happen? We're going to see that x dot is equal to um, ax plus bu, right? But, so x dot is equal to ax plus bu. And, um, and u is equal to what? To minus kx hat. So this is equal to ax minus bkx hat. But what is x hat? We saw before that x hat is equal, equal, equal to, to this. And I'm, uh, there's a typo here. This is x hat dot is equal to um, a minus lc x hat plus bu plus ly. Are you still with me? Yes, no, maybe? We're about to get to the interesting part. All of this is really fantastic, but there's the last gem of the, of the, 
um, of this estimation uh, argument that we're going to make that is going to come in the next 10 minutes. So um, if we just plug in the right stuff, we will see that x dot is going to be related to x. This is x here, right? x dot is going to be equal to a minus bk times x plus bk times e. Well, e dot is going to be equal only to a minus lc, as we saw before, times e. So what is the dynamics of the internal state, of the whole closed loop, of the coupling between these two processes that we have inserted, one being the actual plant and one being the estimator that has a dynamics, right? It's uh, the eigenvalues of the closed loop system. So we go and evaluate the eigenvalues of this big matrix. And this, since we're very lucky, is a block matrix, right? So imagine it as if it was, uh, I don't know, x is really a bad choice. Imagine this is uh, matrix 1, matrix 2, 0, matrix 3, OK? If we want to evaluate the dynamics of this big block matrix, we go and look at the eigenvalues of it. So we do lambda i minus uh, m1, m2, 0, m3. This turns out to be lambda minus m1, m2, 0, m3, lambda minus m3. And the determinant of this is equal to what? Is equal to lambda minus m1 times lambda minus m lambda. Of course, m1 and m3 are, um, are matrices themselves. So the correct way of putting it is lambda i again. And uh, what does this tell us? That lambdas are eigenvalues when the determinant is equal to 0. So, but this is the product of two terms. Imagine it like a big A times a big B equal to zero. When is this true? When either A or either or B are equal to zero. What does this tell us? It tells us that the eigenvalues of the closed loop dynamics by putting the coupling of an observer along with the, the process is the union of the eigenvalues of the first block, top left one, and eigenvalues of the bottom right one. What are top left and bottom right? Top left is A minus BK. Bottom right is A minus LC. There is no interaction. It doesn't matter to the closed loop dynamics that there is an estimator and a process. They are separated. This concept goes under the name of the separation principle, and it's a lifesaver. Why? It has practical implications. It tells us that when you have to design a, contr uh, a control and an, estimation, an estimator to do controls, why, would you, why is it relevant to design an estimator to do controls? Because number six, the state feedback is really great. You actually get really good stuff out of it. So it's the standard approach in many practical problems, even very complex ones. The first thing you do is you figure out a way from your measurements to construct the state. And once you have the state, you pretty much can do whatever you want because of state feedback. So the separation principle tells us that we can design the two things independently from each other. So how do you do it? What are the design guidelines in this process? The first thing you do is you place the... You want to write this down because it's important. Huh? The first thing you do is you want to place the poles of your process. You want to do the controls part. And you place them wherever it makes sense to you. Okay? And then how do you place the poles of the observer? Consider that the ideal case is when... Uh, u is equal to minus kx, right? It's, that's the first thing we studied, because we could do pole placement. Here, of course, now u is not minus kx, it's minus kx hat. We would be very happy if that x hat went to x immediately, like time zero plus epsilon, we already have the, 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 the estimator that converged. In that case, we would be back to the theoretical case, and we're done. So what's the rule of thumb? The rule of thumb is first you design your controller, and then you place the poles of your estimator to be at least 10 times faster than the one, an order of magnitude, 4 to 10 times, 10 times faster than the poles of your controller. That means you want your estimator, which is completely separated, completely independent of your, of your process, to be much faster, much defined as at least an order of magnitude, 10 times faster than the control ones, so that the transient in which the estimate is actually converging to the state is fast. OK? But of course, there's no free lunch, which is the other principle of conservation of the universe. So the more you push your observer, the more you will have a short transient. But in that transient, you will have big errors. 
which is, uh, it's, you never want your estimates to be really out of bounds. It's like when you, when you, when you, when you uh, um, to design the response of a second order system. If you make your, your gain too aggressive, sure, you'll have a, 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 a shorter settling time, but you'll even have a bigger overshoot, right? So there is a trade off there. And then we didn't really plug in the noises here because that's what we're going to do in the next slides. But uh, the L, the, the estimator gain, multiplies the innovation term, y hat minus y. Y is always corrupted by measurement noise. There's always the measurement noise part that acts on Y. So L goes and multiplies N directly. The more you crank up that L, the more you make the observer gain high, the more your estimate is going to be noisy, which depends on what noise you have, but is typically an issue. And so we ask ourselves, huh, is there a better way to do it? No? Look, look at the pattern here. We first did state uh, uh, pull placement of through state feedback. And then we said, ah, but this is nitty gritty details. I don't know how to do it. Let's find a big mathematical machinery that figures it out for us by just focusing on the big picture. And that was LQR. But LQR still needs an estimator. Now we did the pole placement of the estimator. Uh, guess what's the next step? Let's try to figure out a way to design our estimator without having to deal with the nitty gritty details. Let's try to design an estimator automatically following a uh, uh, an optimization approach, uh, uh, an optimality measure. Let's define a performance metric like we did for LQR, and let's see if the math can take care of itself and provide us uh, an observer gain that makes the magic happen without us worrying too much about the details. So just to put some points here, think about the observer as a virtual sensor, okay? If you just take the union of physical sensors and mathematical models, you can create virtual sensors. And virtual sensors allow you to measure what you couldn't measure in practice. You don't have a long camera seeing behind the corner, well, use some mathematical, oh, maybe that's a bad example. But so imagine, imagine uh, an estimator as a, as, as a virtual sensor that leverages mathematical models in order to give you an idea of what's going on. Now, LQR is really great, but you don't have the states. We created a, sta a state estimator, how does the state estimate, what is the best state estimator to plug in the LQR problem in order to make actually LQR work? LQR plus a state estimate, estimator, it's called LQG. It's the cousin of LQR. Linear, Ga linear quadratic Gaussian control, controller. And it's a linear quadratic Gaussian regulator if you use the regulator problem that is the reference is equal to zero. What is, this is my favorite part, so what is the um, best possible uh, uh, estimator that we're going to plug in LQR? The, the estimator that we plug into LQR is, uh, uh, follows the same approach as the design principles of LQR, which is let's take some performance metric that hopefully it's quadratic and hopefully makes a sense in the broadest possible category of cases, and let's try to find the optimal observer that provides us the estimate in the best way that we can, and it doesn't interfere with LQR. It turns out that there exists such an optimal observer for linear time invariant systems, for uh, noises that have some special properties, and uh, uh, this um, observer, it either goes under the name of linear quadratic estimator, you know, a linear quadratic regulator is the controller, linear quadratic estimator, it's the same thing but an estimation, or by the most uh, uh, famous name of Kalman filter. Kalman filters are arguably like the biggest result in controls, like one of the most important things ever. I went to the library like one minute before coming here. The whole course we did today in this class was basically in this book, plus minus other references, okay? But right, what is it? 700 pages, whatever it is. This is a book on the introduction to Kalman filtering, okay? It's very important. Kalman filters will solve a lot of troubles in the real world. So today we're going to have a, a, a we're going to scratch a little bit the surface of Kalman filtering. So why do we do it? Because we want the LQR to work. In order for the LQR, LQR to work, because it's nice, it lets us focus on the big picture, we need an estimator in the loop. 
So what is the final result? I'm afraid we're not going to go through everything, but the final result is the following, that the union of an LQR and the Kalman filter is called an LQG, a linear quadratic Gaussian uh, 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 controller. LQG works in practice. It's beautiful. A ducky bot is controlled by uh, pretty much an LQG, okay? Actually, you're doing LQG in your hardware exercises. The only difference is that the model of the ducky bot is not linear, so we can't really do well. We have to do something more fancy, non-linear stuff, but, but, but the principle is the same. The linear quadratic estimator, or the celebrated Kalman filter, is the optimal estimator for linear time invariant system if the noises are Gaussian and zero mean. And this you might say, yeah, but uh, Gaussian noises, they're perfect. How in the world is it ever going to happen that you have Gaussian noises, right? But there's something called the central limit theorem. Does anybody know what it is? Raise hands if you've ever heard about the central limit theorem. Wow. So the central limit theorem is one of the magic of the universe. If you take infinite sources of random noise and each a random uh, uh, each noise has a random distribution, so you make no assumptions whatsoever. You just take all the possible. I keep, I don't know, put a telescope and look and hear what's coming from the background noise of like everything summed up together. At the limit case, it turns out to be a Gaussian. So Gaussian noises. When you make an assumption and you say your noise is Gaussian, it's actually something that uh, apparently the universe likes. Okay. Because it's actually, you know what, like they, they even use a term that's called normal distribution. Like it's so common, so frequent that we call it normal. When something is normal, normal distribution is a Gaussian. So uh, the Kalman filter is optimal when you have normal distributions with zero mean. And zero mean, you can always figure it out. There's practical ways to do it. And when you put the two things together, you get uh, LQG. What is the important thing to say? We saw that LQR is really uh, robust inherently. And it's nice. We studied in the first half of the course all these things about robustness, and it's really important because model uncertainty is all over the place. We really want to have robust the stuff. The Kalman filter, we will just hint at it today, but it turns out that is like the epitome of robustness. The Kalman filter, you can use it to discover the uncertainties of, of systems. Okay, It's like the best thing ever. But if you put an LQR and a Kalman filter together to make LQG, there's no guarantees on robustness you can make. Okay? So the only catch of the LQG is that you cannot guarantee robustness in presence of model uncertainties and various uh, noises and stuff. So that's, this is going to be the motivation for which in the next class, Claudia is going to talk about H-infinity control, which is a, a, a pretty much a similar method to what we're doing, always performance metrics, do your math, but there you impose uh, robustness. You can guarantee robustness. So this is usual recap slide. No need to go through it. I just don't want to scroll 30 slides to go back. It's just LQR revisited. We uh, say that we saw before that choosing n is a good choice, n equal to 0 for the LQR, because thanks to this choice, you can guarantee robustness. So we just rewrite everything with n equal to 0. There's no news in this slide. It's just for reference purposes. What is a Kalman filter? In particular, uh, the, we're talking about a steady state Kalman filter. Remember, Kalman filtering is a world. There is, I warmly recommend you go and sit in classes uh, in your future that talk about signal processing, about estimation, and Kalman filters are going to be all over the place. Uh, you'll definitely guaranteed hear about Kalman filters again in the future. Um, we are going to look at a very, very corner case, which is the steady state Kalman filter. Why is it steady state? Well, because we're solving the LQR problem, as I said before, in the case of the infinity up there, right? It's a steady state problem we're solving, so we get this version. How do we derive it? The principle is very simple. We saw that controllability and, est and, and estimate, sorry, control problem and estimation problem are dual to each other. So we solved the DLQR. It's a control problem. What if we just take that solution and plug in the dual? What happens? Do, it's exactly what we did before. How do you solve the LQR? Take the Riccati equation, you solve the for P, plug in, get the K from the P from the Riccati equation, and you need these two conditions to be satisfied. Do the dual problem. Plug in exactly what we said before. Crank it out, you get the, the Kalman filter. It's as simple as that to see what the steady state Kalman filter is. But... How do we interpret the Kalman filter? 
Camel filter is born as a stochastic uh, filter. I cannot get into the details of the actual real math or getting in the details uh, thoroughly and explaining the Kalman filter correctly requires introducing uh, uh, probabilistic models, probability, all stuff that is beyond the, the scope of this course. But there is a deterministic, a deterministic interpretation of the Kalman filter that basically uh, tells us that that's the optimal solution if you want to minimize your noises, your uncertainty. You are finding what is the best possible initial condition and choices of the noises, disturbance and noise, such that your measurements justify your, uh, uh, your, your estimates, and justify your observations. And where justify means you're respecting, of course, the dynamical equations that describe the evolution of the system. So I think it's time to go, but I will just say, guys, keep your eyes out on Kalman filters because they're really important. They're everywhere, they're fantastic, and uh, if you put them together, you get an LQG that works in practice. Thank you very much.